The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to a July 4th weekend edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. And um, as my former boss at the Buffalo News would say, let's uh, have some bips and bops today. We don't have any general theme to discuss here on uh, this edition of Tim Graham and Friends, but... um, Let's just get into some things that are going on and we'll see what uh, what strikes a nerve with this. I think right off the top, I want to mention something that I just tweeted out not too long ago. Um, there is a process going on with the Buffalo Bills uh, stadium that involves environmental studies. And it's mandated by law because the stadium is going to be built on county land. So there is an environmental process called SECRA, S-E-Q-R-A. I don't really want to get into it. It's pretty boring, but it's necessary. It's just a step in the process. It doesn't mean anything. This isn't a holdup. But the reason I'm bringing it up is because um, in local news outlets uh, have been showing um, imagery of the stadium layout, where it will be. And within that, there is a stadium shown in these images. And this is not a rendering of the stadium. So whatever you see this, what I call it a brutalist architecture look, uh, brutalist is the type of architecture that you would see the Buffalo News Building, for for instance, is a classic example of brutalist architecture. It's just a lot of cement and flat surface. And, you know, it was an actual in vogue architectural style uh, many decades ago. The FBI building in Washington, D.C. is another uh, prototypical example of of brutalist architecture. So anyway, it looks pretty stern and cold and very detached. (laughs) Looks like ECC South. Right. You're going to see... You're going to see these renderings. I just want to let everybody know that these are not, or I, sh- I shouldn't say, I don't want to say renderings. These are, these are not renderings. You're going to see these images and don't get worked up. This is not what the stadium is going to look like. The renderings haven't been produced. The bills are still going through that with uh, the architect populace. Uh, they have not chosen the exact style that they're going to go with. So anyway. What, what about the renderings that we all saw in proposals and you know, before the stadium deal was done, but possibilities of what the stadium could look like, how accurate. Same thing. They were placeholders. They were generic. And that's exactly what this is. It was explained to me that this is a stick figure. If you were to be uh, sitting at a bar, drawing things out on a napkin, uh, uh, and you needed to, and somebody said uh, to draw a person and you just put a stick figure down to represent, represent the person. That's what these stadium images are, as you'll see in these maps that are going around. Um, because the, the county has to open up this process. It has to allow for public um, discourse. And this is kind of an official thing. Like when, um, you know, there's a job opening and you have to go through the process and you have to post the job opening internally and then you have to post it publicly uh, before you can fill the job. I mean, that's the type of thing that's going on here. This is an environmentally based process that is mandated by law. And uh, as part of that, they need to show where the stadium is going to go. And so in showing where the stadium is going to go, they put a generic stadium to say, here's where it's going to be everybody. Uh, And we're looking into all the different things we have to look into, whether it's soil or traffic or all the other things, it's just necessary. It's a necessary step, nothing to get worried about in terms of a delay or a snag. 
Um, and I think that because people are so visually oriented and hungry for the renderings and to see what this stadium is going to look like, uh, any uh, idea or image, uh, people were going to get worked up. And I, I just kind of tweeted it out as a throwaway. And based on the number of retweets and comments and likes, I, obviously people are found this to be a worthwhile bit of information. This is, this is kind of nothing. So don't get worked up about it. Stadiums don't always even turn out to look like the official renderings. And maybe that won't be the case here, but I know with local college facilities, a lot of times they run over budget and things get changed or just the process of time and materials and architecture. What gets built isn't always what was planned to get built when they put the shovel in the ground. That's right. It's not like it, it, there's a winging it aspect to building a stadium. There are changes. It's not like they can just do things on the fly. Um, but that's that happens. I think mostly it happens internally within the internal aspect of, you know, maybe an infrastructure uh, sometimes, which sounds dangerous actually, but I'm thinking of when um, key bank center was built. Uh, and one of the most expensive things in an arena or in any building is the elevator system. And that arena was supposed to have several more elevators than it did. And in the end, to save money, they just decided, all right, we're only going to have this one elevator that goes to the press box instead of dual elevators or the, the different things that you have around. So, yeah, things get changed to save money uh, quite often. Um, so, anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, no update on actual renderings. We were told that um, we would see them roughly about now. Uh, but there have been some, some stresses, uh, some things going on with Pagula Sports and Entertainment and Kim Pagula's health. And um, I don't know if that's delayed anything in terms of signing off on this or that. Um, not that I'm aware of. But uh, I also don't think that there's any cause for alarm that we haven't seen any renderings yet. I, I was told roughly... This was right after the deal was agreed upon back in March that roughly uh, we would probably start to get renderings uh, in late June, uh, early July. And that's where we are now. So um, maybe uh, so sometime soon, I think we'll, we'll probably be seeing something tangible. Um, what else you got on the stadium, Jonah? I know you're, a, you're a, you have a curious mind. Well, I've always been curious about what kind of community asset the stadium could be in terms of how it gets used, multifunctional. I think the renderings might help to answer some of those questions sporting wise. I don't know. I've read a bit about a community benefits agreement that was not agreed upon what it would be, but agreed that it would exist. I don't know if uh, how maybe you can, you know, a lot more than me, I would think about how far along that is and what that could maybe entail. And if, things have gotten derailed on those discussions. No, uh, I don't, I don't think anything's been that. derailed at all, Jonah. I, I, um, what I do know is going on right now is the seriously tedious process of drawing up the lease. So we've had an agreement. The funding has been dedicated both from the county and the state and the Pagulas have said how much they're going to pay. All of that's been done. There was a memorandum of understanding. The MOU is the, you know, the um, the abbreviation that you hear thrown around all the time, the MOU is one thing. Now they have to actually do the hard negotiation of the lease, which can be anything from, okay, this is how many county police officers, uh, this is how many people from the sheriff's department are going to be assigned on game days. This is what we're going to do in terms of traffic control. Here are the number of, you know, workers that are needed you know, all the different things that need to be signed off on from the state, from the county, from the bills, and it goes all back and forth and it takes a long time. So the memorandum of understanding is a very simple document, relatively speaking. The actual lease is, you know, four inches thick if you were to print it out. And it's just a lot of, uh, you, you can't just rip up the previous lease or, or cut and paste or do a search and replace. Uh, you have to Kind of in in many ways, when you're dealing with a new stadium, you're gonna have to start from scratch. You know, this is a brand new building with different technologies. With uh, it's in a different location, and so 
yeah, I, I'm guessing that there are some things that you can just carry over from the previous agreement, but also this is now a state owned facility. This is not a county owned facility anymore. So there's a lot to go through with this new lease that hasn't needed to be considered in the past. So there's a lot going on here with this, with this, the tedium is I'm going to keep using that, that uh, word or a version of that word. It is from what I understand, it is just mind numbingly grueling. These are attorneys dealing with these things. Um, you think you have an agreement on one clause in the contract and that's put to bed, but then it rears its head, you know, a week later uh, because it ties in with a different clause. And so anyway, it's boring to hear me do a synopsis of it right now. Uh, so you can imagine how boring it is to actually sit in there in those meetings and actually uh, hammer out every little detail that goes into putting on a game. I mean, think of all the things that happen behind the scenes. You show up at a stadium and you hand somebody your ticket and you go to your seat and you watch a football game. But think of all the things that go on within that stadium from law enforcement to safety, the EMS, uh, traffic in and out, the concessions, uh, maintenance, uh, who's going to pay for uh, if there is a water main break or if, you know, something happens with the field, uh, you know, all these different things that have to uh, be considered. And uh, that's that's what they're going through right now, which is why we're not hearing much. Uh, there's really not a lot to, to say. Right. I mean, it's, it's not like it's our money paying for this thing, so we don't need to know. Right. That's right. Well, that's the, but your, your elected officials are handling this for you. Um, you did mention the community benefits agreement, and that is something that I'm interested in too, but um, I don't know exactly how, whether that's part of the lease, um, whether that's a side deal. Um, what I read, and this is an investigative post reporting from a couple of weeks ago, Jeff Kelly, is that it's in the MOU that there would be a community benefits agreement, right. but no terms have been established or, I mean, maybe they've been negotiated, but nothing has been decided or announced what that would entail and that the actual deal has to be written up by September 1st. So there, it could kind of run out the clock on the public getting to negotiate it and figure out the elected officials, figure out what that is. Maybe that's going on behind the scenes that we don't know. I, I, I think that is because I, I am aware that there are elected officials who have been involved in these discussions. And I don't know how far along they are in putting down specific, um, you know, anything with specificity uh, on paper in terms of what the bills will be doing for the community. I know that they've been speaking in philosophical terms and that both sides were happy with where it was, which is what helped get that deal done back in March. Um, things like community outreach, getting involved with Buffalo Public Schools uh, or disadvantaged, you know, sc schools that you know need um, that need help uh, in terms of um, educational programs or. Um, mentorships or things like that through the bills where just. Uh, children of need or schools that that um, that are that need better opportunities for their students can work with the bills on fast tracking and for in professional services or you know then I'm, and I'm speaking in, in vague terms based on what I've heard I don't I don't know this to be but this is the type of thing uh, that they've been talking about um, and I'm sure you know there there are you know ways to help out in terms of jobs but here's the thing that when it comes to the football team, uh, or a football game, so many of those jobs are just temporary. And we know that, you know, ticket takers and concessionaires and, you know, it's, you know, there's, there are things that, you know, that these aren't life changing jobs. Yes. It's a side gig or something like that. Uh, public transportation is another one. You're helping people from the city be able to attend football games, uh, you know, through the, through Metro or, um, you know, whatever public transportation. I mean, there's all kinds of things um, that have been kicked around, but in terms of specifics of, uh, of the uh, community benefits agreement, I, I, don't, I don't think or know that anything has been um, put down on paper. What in I'm curious of, yes, this is something that under, you know, that we are bound and under, under uh, signed agreement to provide X, Y, Z, uh, here as we speak on July 1st. I'm curious when it does get settled 
and you alluded to this, what community receives the benefit of the stadium being built in Orchard Park across the street from the old stadium with a lot of existing infrastructure and things like that. I, I was never really in favor of the stadium being built downtown for a lot of reasons, but there was an argument that that would have benefited the inner city downtown community, even up into the east side of Buffalo in ways that a suburban stadium does not. But maybe there's something within the community benefits agreement that can have that effect. And maybe the tragedy that happened at top supermarkets a couple of weeks ago, months ago, focuses or motivates where some of that money and economic drive is pointed towards. Right. Look, the stadiums being built in Orchard Park slash Hamburg, right? Uh, those are school districts that probably don't need a handout uh, from the Buffalo Bills, like Buffalo Public Schools might, or Lackawanna, or Chictawaga, or, and I'm, and I'm speaking, I mean, I don't really know the finances of all the school districts, but, you know, we, it's been tight in a lot of them, that the, the Kenton schools, um, I'm not exactly sure, where, but I'm, I'm guessing it's not going to go to Orchard Park, um, that the Bills are aware of this from the conversations that I've had, and this predates uh, the, the top shooting. I mean, this predates a lot of the, you know, the, the hyper awareness that we have of what's been going on on the east side, um, that this was something that, you know, Crystal People Stokes was involved with, and, and they've been having discussions behind the scenes that people are comfortable with moving forward. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's important to, the bills are getting a shitload of public money and they need to find ways to give back to the, uh, to the public in ways that it's, uh, that it's important, that it's significant help, uh, that it can provide to help people pull up from, um, from bad circumstances. Uh, and, and I think it's, you know, it's it's incumbent upon the bills in the state and the county to make sure this happens, too, because if you're going to be giving this money to the bills instead of to hospitals and libraries and schools and you know law enforcement or public safety or you know mental health, uh, then, yeah, you need to find ways to help people in their general circumstance. Um, if you are going to be giving a uh, billion dollars. Roughly to. Uh, to a football team so it can have a place to play. And even just for appearances sake, not that that's the reason it should be, but having something to say, this is what a new stadium benefits the taxpayers and even the fans and the customers. Cause we've been told for a long time that the bills need a new stadium, but I don't see too much evidence from the fans that go to the stadium that they're begging and asking for a new stadium. So I think we need to see, ways why a new stadium and a new stadium deal and a new infrastructure uh, benefits the people and the fans and the community itself. Right. And that's not to say also that this is uh, six of one, half dozen of the other. Uh, obviously, the money, and I've been on record uh, on this for years, uh, I am against the Pagulas receiving any public money for a stadium. Uh, that said, uh, you do run the risk of losing your team. And that's the gamble that you have to be willing to, um, you have to be willing to call that bluff, I guess, uh, if you, if you want to be hardline about that. So I think the reality of it, realistically speaking, I knew that public money was going to go towards the stadium, whether I liked it or not. Um, the community benefits agreement is not, um, like I say, six of one, half dozen of the other. It's just because the bills are going to in turn do some things for the community as a member of Western New York, as a, as a beacon, uh, as a community asset that a football team is, doesn't mean that it's the same as, as if dollar for dollar that money was given directly to the community. Uh, so this mitigates uh, that. The fact that it's coming through a football team as opposed to being given directly from the county or from the state uh, is hugely different. Uh, a community benefits agreement to me is the least you can do. It's not like uh, when I say it's incumbent on the bills to do this, uh, this is a bare minimum. Um, and there are all different ways that you can do it. Like I said, there's a philosophical approach that you can take to it. Uh, there are you know programs that you can start, scholarships, um, uh, things like that, you know, different programs, um, whatever. Um, but the bills can, kind of pull in their resources and end up like you see with um, 
uh, with the, um, oh, geez, I'm having a brain cramp, uh, maybe because it's the holiday weekend already, uh, personal seat licenses, PSLs. I had PSL on my mind and I couldn't think of uh, what, what it stood for for a second. So you have these PSLs that are going to pay for the Pagula share of it. There are ways that NFL teams can find to fund things in which they don't pay for it. I mean, that's a pretty common thing for corporations to do. They set up a foundation uh, and maybe they, they seed it with a million dollars. But over the course of time, they're going to give out $10 million worth of scholarships or, or uh, grants. Uh, and that's being funded by donations. You know, Even it's just not as, you taking know, so, out debt. Billionaires can get loans a lot easier. Than right, that. exactly. So, again, um, I guess this is my long-winded way of saying that this community benefits agreement, it sounds cool, and it is. It's better than nothing, but it's not, it's not enough to, to me to, to warrant you know, the fact that, okay, we're going to give you all this money. Now give us something back. Well, you're only going to be getting a fraction back uh, of what the bills um, are, are receiving from, from the county and the state. Uh, but I do think it's important. You got me thinking just contrasting the two facilities. Um, the downtown arena, the hockey arena, H, you know, Key Bank Center, there is much more kind of public clamoring for that to at least be renovated and rejuvenated and a lot of things that are overdue from a maintenance standpoint and making it more of a fan-friendly, modern style arena with some of the accessories that we'll probably see in the football stadium but there's much less expectation that any public money would go toward that um it's a smaller deal on a newer facility but maybe one that needs upgrading for a longer period of time than the football stadium does just kind of what do you think about and the pagulas don't seem to have an appetite right now to put much money into that project anytime soon you know where do you think that goes and do you think the public money and yeah, it should go it's in. interesting so okay let me let me let's because we're comparing the two venues let's it let's state right off the top the stadium was older it was the third it still is the third oldest stadium in the nfl behind only lambeau field and arrowhead stadium the upper deck was in serious jeopardy and within a few years, you're talking about losing the upper deck or needing to close half the stadium down to build that, you know, to build one upper deck, then closing the other half to build the upper upper the other upper deck at immense cost. So there are safety issues plus money issues. Key Bank Center is not falling down. Now, it may seem like it if you're a season ticket holder and you have stained seats and uh, the popcorn hasn't been cleaned up from the last game and your cup holders busted and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there are all kinds of things. Um, I will say, you know, the Pagula's not having an appetite for putting much money into the Key Bank Center. This is a county owned facility. Yes, the Sabres do play there, but this was built four owners ago. This was built for the Knox family, right? Um, the Regas's, yeah. Galasano, and now Pagula. I mean, it's, uh, there's, there's been a lot of wear and tear under the watch of other owners too. And I could see the Pagula is saying, you know, look, I mean, we're going to foot the bill to, you know, get this thing back to where it needs to be after all this, uh, all this time of neglect and just aging. Um, so there's just that aspect of it. I, now, granted, Terry Pagula is worth billions of dollars. And he could pay for it. And again, I would like to see ownership uh, across all sports, not just in Buffalo, but in all sports and all towns take a greater responsibility. You know, you see what's going on as I go off on a little bit of a tangent here. See what's going on with the Washington Commanders and Daniel Snyder, how much money he has, how he keeps stepping in it. Uh, he's refusing to uh, speak in front of Congress after he's called to testify. Uh, his workplace harassment scandal and all the other different scandals that have gone on with the Washington commanders. And you have all the different public entities all around the DC area turning their backs on Daniel Snyder. Maryland doesn't want him. Virginia doesn't want him. DC doesn't want him. You know, it's, it's refreshing to see. And I do think that we're nearing uh, a, a place of total uh, lack of appetite for helping out owners, especially as, you know, even this Deshaun Watson thing, it doesn't even have to be stadium related. I think people are just getting so disgusted 
with leagues and how they run themselves, how they police themselves, what's going on with the Miami Dolphins, uh, with the Brian uh, Flores lawsuit and Stephen Ross trying to upend his organization so he can bring in Tom Brady and, and Sean Payton. And uh, it, it, there's just a lot of, a lot of scandal going on. And I think the, the appetite for public money on stadiums, I, I think the Pagulas kind of got in under the wire a little bit. And I've written about that in the past. There's just, you even see bills being uh, presented uh, for uh, lawmakers trying to pass bills to, to stop um, public funding going towards stadiums. Um, the state, New York state is not going to spend a penny on Key Bank Center. So it's a much I, different. It is I different. Am. I don't know that to be true though, Jonah. I, I think that there could be something rolled, rolled together, especially if Kathy Hochul is, if she's able to win reelection over Lee Zeldin. You think so with, with all the – because it's different than football stadiums. There's arenas in New York City and elsewhere around the state. It would open up, I, I would think, a lot of expectations that a Pandora's box, if you will, that the state is in the business of paying for all of these facilities right. statewide. And I think that it's tougher, although the, there's always been talk of Hamilton, uh, a second team in Toronto, uh, you know, different – Quebec City – you know, there are teams or places where you could relocate a hockey team, but I think that the NHL really, really wants the NHL in Buffalo. I don't if people have talked about Terry Pagula saving the Sabres and all these other things, Tom Galisano saving the Sabres. I don't think that the Sabres are going anywhere, nor the NHL doesn't want it. Uh, and maybe they'll use threats and things like that to help uh, get more money out of, out of the state of New York. And that's right out of the playbook, right? Uh, we just, it just wasn't as overt from Roger Goodell in the NFL when it came to the bills, because it didn't get to that point, but that card was ready to be played at some point. Uh, it just didn't get there because Kathy Hochul took over for Andrew Cuomo. And I, I do think if Andrew Cuomo were still in office, that the bills would have played that card. They would have been forced to because Cuomo and based on all my sources uh, involved in those talks, um, Cuomo had no interest in coming to the bargaining table with the bills. He was going to force them to threaten to leave which is savvy politics. Uh, he, he was basically saying, if I'm going to give you all this money, you're going to be the bad guy in this. Um, I'm, you're going to have to force me to give you this money. I'm not just going to give it to you. Whereas Kathy Hochul was a little more amenable to giving the money uh, without the, the Pagulas needing to say, okay, well, now we're looking at San Antonio or we're looking, well, San Antonio really wasn't one, but we're looking at Birmingham or we're looking Austin. at Oklahoma City or where? Austin, Texas. Austin, right. Austin, Austin, that wasn't legit. Um, but yeah, that's the, the one, that's the one that was recorded. San Diego. Now here's the thing where Kathy Hochul took some heat. Let me tell you a little something about San Diego. Um, Kathy Hochul took some heat. And for me too, I think I even tweeted a couple of, you know, eyebrow, like I raised an eyebrow when Kathy Hochul went on radio and said that San Diego, people were like, San Diego is not going to build a stadium. They, they didn't even want their chargers. Uh, what are you talking about? San Diego's ridiculous. San Diego's legit. And it was a legit possibility if the Bills were forced to. And I'll tell you why. Uh, take a look at the football stadium that San Diego State uh, just built. Uh, it is uh, convertible to an NFL stadium at a cost, I've been told, of about 650, I think, or $700 million. It, you could add the upper deck and you could turn it into, you take it from a Pac-12 slash, Big Ten. Uh, um, what, what, what are they? No, I said Big Ten, but that was a joke. Right, they're not, well, maybe, with this new stadium. Uh, what, um, the, the conference. Well, are they in the WAC or the oh, WCC? Not the WAC, uh, what UNLV's in? The WCC, the West Coast Conference? No, that was that was Tarkanian back in the day. What uh, What's the conference? Oh, yeah, San Diego State and... Uh, San Jose State and Mountain West. Sorry, it finally came to me. The Mountain West. I think San Diego State's in the Mountain West. You're right. I should uh, so at a very inexpensive rate, think of what you're paying for a Bills stadium, $1.4 billion. For half that, or maybe even less than half that, you can convert San Diego State Stadium into an NFL stadium, welcome your, your new San Diego Bills, or whatever they were going to be, uh, right on in there. Uh, that was legitimate. And that is not something I'm pulling out of my ass. Uh, that is something that um, I've come to learn. And uh, 
So, uh, but the Bills never had to play that card. The Pagulas didn't. And it, it was a break for Bills fans that Andrew Cuomo resigned uh, and that Kathy Hochul took over as governor because it got this deal done. Uh, and now you don't have to worry about it. It would have been quite, I don't know if ironic's the word, but interesting had the Bills moved to San Diego, considering that the Braves, Buffalo Braves moved to San Diego years ago, 40 something years ago. And remember there was that era where John Butler went to the San Diego Chargers and a lot of Bills sure. executives and players and, you know, the culture. It seemed they were, they were the San Diego Bills for he a He took Dwight Smith and Buddy Nix with them and they had great success. They, they were one of the greatest teams to never make it to a Super Bowl, those Chargers teams with LaDainian Tomlinson and Phillip Rivers. And, you know, they had a ton of talent. Um, Doug Flutie. For at least sure. Time. Junior Seau. Some good teams. Um, Jonah, we talked uh, real quick. I mean, we'll touch on this. Um, we have some guests next week. We're going we're gonna to get into this a little bit more. But let's just kind of tip our hand here. Um, I mentioned all three teams uh, 10 minutes ago in regard to the NFL having a pretty rough offseason. Um, who do you think is having the worst offseason so far? The Browns with Jimmy Haslam and Deshaun Watson, the Dolphins and the Stephen Ross mess with firing Brian Flores, triggering that class action lawsuit against the NFL on minority uh, hiring, which Brian Flores uh, says that uh, he was enticed uh, or rewarded to tank, uh, and then the failed coup, I guess, to try to get um, Tom Brady uh, and Sean Payton or the uh, Washington Commanders and everything that's going on with Dan Snyder. Well, I, I think it's difficult to rank because the dynamics of what's going on are, are so different. And I think you could throw – well, you could kind of throw the Las Vegas Raiders in there, even though it's not the offseason, but it started during the season. And it's extending. There's lawsuits and all sorts well, of – Well, actually, you could throw that into the commander's stew, right? Right, yeah, because yeah. Because it's, that's, it that's came from that investigation. And the Houston Texans are connected into this Deshaun Watson scenario, and it's been – Right. Bad look for them. And, and, you know, they get the draft picks in the trade, but it, it hasn't been a good off season for that franchise. There's probably other teams we could think of just from a roster standpoint that have bad things. Not to be flippant, the Buffalo Bills have had an excellent football off season and the players that they've acquired and things like that. But one owner is in the hospital. There's been a tragic mass shooting in the community that the team plays that it's not the same thing, but the, it's hard to say it's been a good off season when, things like that happen around a team. But to answer your question, I would say it starts with transgressions by ownership and the institutional problems that we've seen with the Washington football organization and, you know, Miami and Las Vegas. And even though the Deshaun Watson situation is, you know, bad, on its face for what Deshaun Watson has been accused of doing and maybe he has done and whatever's going to happen. I don't know if it's so bad for the Cleveland Browns. They made a mistake in trading what they, they traded, traded for him for. and gave him the richest contract in NFL history. And they kind of knew that a suspension was coming with the way they structured the contract, but and they claimed to do all this background check and then new, new information kept coming out. It seemed like every week that there was stuff that, that no, that uh, even the attorneys weren't aware of. Right. Yeah, I don't. I mean, maybe I'm. The Browns didn't talk in, but didn't even I, speak to the uh, the uh, defense attorney or the um, the the uh, the attorney for the uh, accusers. Yeah, but I think that Deshaun Watson is going to get suspended for a period of time, a full season, a half season. Then I think he's going to end up being the Browns' quarterback and being the quarterback that they thought they were getting. And I guess I'd be more interested in talking to people in Cleveland and Cleveland Browns fans. There's a lot of people that seem to say they're not going to be fans of the team any longer I don't think it's going to hurt the long-term future of the franchise but maybe I'm wrong maybe another owner who wants a new stadium by the way think of how new that stadium is and because it was rushed into construction it's falling apart in some places it's a bad location there's no uh the development around there has been slow Jimmy Haslam wants a new stadium and this I mean can you imagine could you imagine going to uh you know hoping to get some public funding when you are the guy who traded for Deshaun Watson, bringing him into your community, the Bills are, or the Browns are going to have to win a, or make a serious run at a Super Bowl for people to forget this, I think. 
I mean, you're from that area, so maybe you understand it a lot better than me. I, I don't. I, I do think the timing now, they couldn't, you know, make a big ass like that right now. But in a year or two, if the Cleveland Browns are playing better and Deshaun Watson is playing, um, not to compare what they did. Well, I guess Michael Vick had to leave Atlanta, but years went by and Michael Vick played in Philadelphia and was embraced by the fan in the league and everything else. I do think that could happen for Deshaun Watson a year or two or three down the line. And if it happens in a Cleveland Browns uniform and they win, uh, they still might be able to trade. Michael Vegas. Vick, I will say this about Michael Vick, though. He admitted what he did, as heinous as it was. He was contrite. He worked hard uh, in terms of he gave a lot of money and resources. And you can't make up for what he did. But he tried. Deshaun Watson is denying that he that it's ever even been a problem. So Michael Vick had his his retribution tour. Like he had his um, not a comeback. It, it was a comeback, but he it, it was a rebirth of some of some kind. I don't know that Deshaun Watson is showing any signs of going through any kind of rebirth. It's just going to be whether or not he's a good football player. Michael Vick, at least, is, there are some people who will never forgive him, uh, but there were people who were willing to forgive found a totally different Michael Vick than the one who went to prison. And he also went to prison. Deshaun Watson's not going to prison. There's, there's also a you do your crime, you do your time mentality, I think, that happened with Michael Vick, um, that Deshaun Watson's not going to go through that phase. It doesn't seem. And you think the Cleveland Browns will pay for all of those sins and they won't be – won't be able to draw fans or, or no, I'm not saying public, that. I mean, f- fans are fans. They're, if if the if there's winning football, they're they're going to go. But I mean, it's still a. But if you want to go to the government and say I need some money to build a new stadium, I mean, Jimmy Haslam's not exactly a warm and fuzzy individual right about now. Here's a guy who was involved in his own business scandal too, right when he first bought the Browns with his uh, his truck stops. I mean, this is a guy who's been riddled with controversy. He is, he and Dan Snyder are in the same, you know, small, smaller fraternity within the fraternity. This is, this is a league that's been riddled with controversy. I guess maybe that's much sure. I don't know. If well, that's what I mean when I was saying earlier that yeah. I think the appetite for this stuff is just going out the window. I mean, just like people are fed up with this in general. That's what, do you think that? Because I think when the ball gets kicked off and, and now we don't even have to wait for that. People are, still you know 70 days away from kickoff and everybody's counting down doing their 53-man projections i just think when the games are played the nfl is so popular and so ingrained in the culture and the thinking of so many different people that there's like a cognitive separation they don't worry about these situations once the games are played i don't know i mean i i'd I'd like to talk to somebody who was a fan of the washington what their former name was and through to now be in the Washington commanders. And cause that's a franchise I think that has turned off its fan base in many ways over many years for many different reasons, but I don't know if they have, I think that's well, I think as popular as they always have been with Washington. I think if you're a Washington fan, you can say, well, that's my owner. I don't get to pick my owner. There hasn't really been an on the field. I mean, not that I'm thinking of, it's been a lot of just off the field shadiness, I think people know, but the Jack Del Rio, that. some of the things that he says, that's sure. not on the field, but that's the football team. Yeah, but you, it's not the quarterback. Um, there are a lot of Pittsburgh Steelers fans that forgave Ben Roethlisberger. Uh, he was never charged, although, you know, the, the DA in that case made it clear that he that what he thought happened, gave out some of the facts of the case uh, in a move that a lot of people thought was uh uh, pretty bold that he he didn't press charges, but said what he knew and really kind of tore Ben Roethlisberger a new one. Um, and I do know, and my my brother included, he was a diehard Steelers fan. He couldn't root for the Steelers anymore after that. But this the Steelers fan base remains one of the strongest of all time, in part because of Ben Roethlisberger and how good he was in Super Bowls. Um, so yeah, but what Deshaun Watson, of course, is accused of doing is way worse than, uh, or at least the, hell, uh, the volume of it anyway, um, is, um, is obnoxious. Um, but, uh, there was a bigger point. Oh, you were saying about, about how we are able to set a lot of things aside and get excited about our fantasy teams and placing our bets on the games and tailgating and all that stuff. 
But I, it goes back to what I was saying regarding lawmakers. They're not all football fans. I mean, we're talking about people who we know, you know, sports fans, people who uh, pay my mortgage, um, people who, you know, we're surrounded by uh, every day of the week. We're, we are sports fans. We know how sports are. We enjoy sports. But there are lawmakers out there who they don't necessarily care about football. Um, and they're the ones who hold the, hold the purse strings when it comes to public funding and needing to um, answer to their constituents. And if you take, you know, obviously football is the highest rated television show week in, week out, year in, year out. But still, more people don't watch football than do watch football. And I think that there does come a point where it's, it's a bridge too far. I think that the NFL's goodwill in terms of, you know, public funding and, you know, especially in certain states um, is, is nearing an end. That's just my sense. It's my yeah. sense of things. I don't really disagree maybe in feeling that way myself or empathizing with that kind of thought. I just, I think going back many years with different scandals regarding concussions or, you know, all the different player conduct, criminality, Ray Rice, all the different types of things that have happened. Domestic violence, there was, there's been a long wave of a lot of players getting in trouble year after year. And it's never seems to have stuck to the NFL to ruin the NFL's brand. The NFL's brand has only gotten better and better and better. And maybe this is a tipping point. Maybe it's not. I don't know. I think it's a, there are little tipping points that I think that add up. Um, and, uh, you know, one, here's one thing that I always had. a. am not saying that I'm, I bat a thousand on these things when I have a feel for it. But um, I can't help but pat myself on the back. I, I've been talking about this for years. We bring it up on occasion. This goes back to the terrestrial radio days. Uh, we would have this discussion every now and then. I would ask various guests. Uh, and I said that I felt this coming for a long time is which essentially the NCAA and certain schools or certain conferences are going to turn pro. And I think we're getting closer and closer to that. I want to ask you what you think about what's going on in the Big Ten. These super conferences are getting super duper. And I think at some point they become more powerful than the NCAA and they know it. And you're going to get to a point and we have name image likeness money already coming in. Um, I think you get to a point where it's just flat out. You are going to get paid to come and play for Alabama. You're going to get paid to play and come for Ohio state by the school itself. Uh, and we don't need the NCAA anymore. We'll fund our intercollegiate sports. We now have a super conference here in the big 10. Uh, we are going to have our rowing and our softball and our baseball, and we are going to play a championship among ourselves. And maybe uh, the we are going to go play the uh, the other professional Southeastern Conference, and we'll have a World Series of uh, rifling, uh, or a World Series of uh, name your Olympic sport or your non revenue sport, Jonah. Um, and here we go. Uh, we got our own thing going here. We don't need the rest of it. Well, I don't know. I think a lot of those things could happen. I don't know if they're all connected. We've disagreed on this theory you have about the professional college leagues. And the reason I don't really see it going quite that way is that the biggest schools making the most money and the biggest conferences are also the ones that have really tried to push back and not um, embrace the NIL and paying players as much as uh, you would think if they wanted that to be the end game. They still seem to want this situation where the schools make all the television money and ticket revenue and all the different revenues that they bring in. And it's now been decided by the courts and the Congress that the players are entitled to their NIL money and they're getting it that way. Some of it's coming from recruiting collectives, but it isn't really the, it's not coming out of the, the major colleges and the major conferences pie of revenues. It's not coming like everything that's happening right now with the big 10 taking teams from taking UCLA and USC from the pack 12, now 10, I guess down to 10 again, that's all being driven by the television contract, and that's all going to be split among the teams in the Big Ten, and the SEC is doing the same thing with Texas and Oklahoma. But none of that's being redistributed to the players directly. The, the players making their NIL money is coming from a different type of revenue source. Um, I do see the kind of super leagues that you're talking about coming where there might be 
16, there are already six teams. There might be 20, 24 different teams in the Big Ten and the SEC, and those leagues will have certain powers. Maybe, Jonah, maybe my my idea doesn't come from the Big Ten or the SEC. Maybe it comes from the SWAC or some other uh, group of schools that decides we can't even compete anymore. So what the hell difference does it make? Let's let's just perhaps you know uh, something that like that. Interesting. That would be an interesting dynamic because that would be going against what the NCAA stated policy. So a lot of people seem to assume that maybe someday the SEC or the Big Ten or both the super conferences, the super leagues will break away from the NCAA. I'm not so sure that's coming in terms of all the sports besides football. I think that is coming as it relates to football. We might see football conferences separate from the whole other college sports landscape. But that aside, the smaller the league is, you know, let's take a local league, the MAC. I think they're more interested in the status quo with the NCAA and keeping the NCAA going and not breaking away from the NCAA to pay players with, oh, by the way, does MAC schools or SWAC schools have that kind of money to do that anyways. But it would be an interesting pivot for maybe a mid-tier league if they saw that coming and did go in that way. But it just only works for one or two, maybe even three sports. You really, you can't pay all of the athletes in 16 different sports and sports that already are money losers, I think, and get very far unless you're bringing in huge television dollars and the schools that are bringing in huge television contracts from the conferences and from, you know, ESPN and Fox and things like that, they want to keep that money. They want to spend it elsewhere on the campus or just have bigger and bigger businesses. Let's so also mention know. Notre Dame might be joining the big 10 also. I, I think Notre Dame will join the big 10, but I mean, that's been a conversation that's been happening for 30, 40 something years. Um, I mean, I think I, I don't, Maybe it doesn't go this way. I think there's going to be a restructuring of college sports. It's going to have football because all of these television deals are being driven by football. Different, whether it's two big conferences, three big conferences. It's going to be the same kind of 60 to 70 teams that currently make up the power five. And that's going to be how the football playoff is determined. And they might allow some participation from the group of five, but I think a lot of that depends on how much they need other schools and other conferences to play non-conference games, or do these leagues have robust enough television packages that they can just play conference games and not play non-conference games or not need to buy games to fill their stadiums. I, I don't know. But anyways, I don't know if it all, but it doesn't all trickle down to every sport. E even now with UCLA and UC USC leaving uh, the Pac-12, USC has the defending national champions in beach volleyball. They don't have a conference because there's no beach volleyball in the Big Ten. And all these different sports and the travel and the way it's going to disrupt their schedules, I'm not so sure that's a permanent solution. That Maybe if these things get broken off for football, I think UCLA and USC go back to the Pac-10 or the Pac-12 for every other sport because that's where they belong. And we might see some sort of legacy you know, reconfiguration around the – provincial and territorial conferences that seems to be crumbling apart, but it makes sense in a lot of different sports and what a about, lot of different contexts. What about this? This is just a, I'm spitballing here. You, you mentioned uh, the beach volleyball there, which makes me think, all right, but there are other beach volleyball schools out there in California, especially what if schools just start banding by sport in terms of conference, you know, the, the intercollegiate, Beach volleyball conference, and well, and and then what you have is a meritocracy where just because you're in the conference doesn't if you're not any good then and then what happens is the best are just going to be against the best and and those could be perhaps financially stable. You get sponsorship or the fact that you're good enough, uh, the talent is there, and then the schools. Let's say Oregon State had a beach volleyball team in the in the Pac-12. Well, they don't survive because the concentration of beach volleyball schools down in Southern California and San Diego are just too dominant. I mean, and you yeah, can do that I for mean, any sport. You can do that with baseball and softball and anything else. You see it already with college hockey. There's yeah, but, yeah. hockey is a bastardized. All, those are all right. bastardized leagues. Yeah. And hockey even has schools like St. Lawrence and Clarkson that are division one hockey and division three in other sports. And, and 
maybe you might see a little bit more of that. You know, a lot of this really depends on the NCAA tournament, and it depends on the television networks that pay to broadcast the NCAA tournament. Do they still want the structure that exists and goes back historically of all these different schools from around the country and 300 plus division one teams that can play in this NCAA tournament. You can have the upsets, you can have Cinderella, you can have St. Peter's. If CBS and Turner don't want that anymore, I don't think that has value as a television product. Then you could see the super leagues going together and the basketball championship will be controlled that way. And the whole structure of the NCAA breaks apart because the NCAA tournament funds a lot of the NCAA operations and then the NCAA tournament shares go into these budgets and how a lot of these schools make money. But I don't see that happening soon, maybe down the line, but I don't see that happening soon. Jonah, I just realized that I've been doing this entire podcast with my computer microphone. Uh, after everything that we did uh, to get started here, we had uh, some technological, or I had some technical difficulties with my microphone getting set up. So let's, uh, let's just see what happens here. I'm gonna switch my microphone to the microphone it's supposed to be on. And you can tell me if you uh, hear me. How ridiculous is this? Do you still have me? We still have you. I thought that was going to be goodbye because when we did this no. before the show, there was silence whenever you switched to this microphone. And if for whatever reason, it didn't flip over uh, when we hit record. Or I, I'm sure it was user error. Um, so anyways, all right. Well, now we're set for here for the last five minutes of the show. Um, Jonah, I just want to bring it up. Uh, since we are, I said it was drips and drabs, bips and bops. Dots and dashes. Um, July 1st, uh, it is uh, not, it wasn't the end of my Sabres beat writing career because I went a little bit longer. I actually covered that draft, which was the Patrick Kane draft in 2007. But July 1st, 2007, the day that Chris Drury signed with the New York Rangers and Daniel Briere signed with the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, Jeremy White uh, tweeted my story uh, from that day, which back in the newspaper days, uh, I had written the day before uh, and ran on July 1st in which, uh, and I'll read some of it here. Let's read, uh, bear with me. Um, It was nice of Jeremy White to commemorate this day. Fifth, what are we talking? 15 years ago, right? 2007, yes. Daniel Briere and Chris Drury could have new uniforms this after. Oh, wait, let me give you the headline. Let's see what the headline is. Briere Drury up for grabs when free agency starts at noon. July 1st, 2007 by Tim Graham, Buffalo News. Daniel Briere and Chris Drury could have new uniforms this afternoon. By most accounts, they might as well be considered former Buffalo Sabres co-captains already. The free agency market opens for business at noon today. Of the dozens of players up for grabs, Briere and Drury are among the five or six most coveted. They shouldn't remain unattached for long. Uh, Daniel Briere says, there's a few teams that have asked where we're going to be at noon. Uh, Briere said Saturday night from Southern California, where he's meeting with his agent for the purpose of fielding offers together. It looks like teams are interested, but until then, we can't do much. We hear the rumors and try to prepare for different teams that will contact us. Briere and his agent had better leave. Uh, Briere and his agent better have call waiting. Same goes for Drury and his representative. The Sabres, meanwhile, might want to consider who their next captain will be. Their vaunted team chemistry probably is about to get a whole lot more unstable. Uh, the leading candidates to land Briere are the Philadelphia Flyers and Montreal Canadiens. The Los Angeles Kings are said to be interested in bringing both Briere and Drury aboard, signings that could make them an immediate playoff contender. I forgot about that. The Kings, that was a big rumor. They wanted Briere and Drury both as a package deal. Uh, the Sabres appear out of the running to retain Briere, who on Thursday rejected their five-year $25 million offer. The Sabres waited nearly six weeks to make the offer, a move that apparently alienated their leading scorer, as evidenced by the fact that he declined to negotiate further with the Sabres over the final days before the free agency period began. He was uh, at the time on a one-year $5 million contract that came through arbitration the year before, and the Sabres could have begun negotiating with him in January and declined until the week of or the week before free agency and offered him the same pay rate, but for five years after he was coming off a great year 
Drury, uh, it came out later uh, through my reporting, also with John Vogel and Bucky Gleason. Uh, the, the Sabres thought they had a deal with Drury uh, during the season. They kept it quiet because they didn't want to piss off Danny Briere. Uh, and when it came time, after Drury then was waiting for a contract to sign, never got the contract. And then he has a great year. And at the end of the year, they're like, uh, hey, Chris, remember that contract you agreed to? And he's like, yeah, things have changed. I just had a great year. <laughs> Um, and so the Sabres end up losing both of them. Um, what I remember about that day, I was working at the Buffalo news offices because it was going to be a big day. And I wanted to be there in the, in the office and turn and to deal with my editors directly and talk about coverage and things like that. I want to, I want to say it was a Saturday. It was a weekend. I'm pretty sure. Um, but I was, I, uh, got a text. I mean, this is, uh, the, the faith and then the re the relationship that I had with Daniel Briere at the time. Um, he told me, he told me first, and I was able to break that story. He told me that he was signing with the Flyers. And um, back then, and as it is now, the NHL Players Association was very forthright in, in their contracts. They didn't keep it secret. Um, they they it had a website, in fact, where you could go and see exactly how much everybody got paid. Um, and there was the deal. And that's what I remember about that day. It was the beginning of, we had a Sabres Edge blog. Blogs were still new back then. The Buffalo News uh, had, it was the first blog in Buffalo News history. It was called the Sabres Edge. I'm pretty sure. Was this uh, the first post? And no. no, it wasn't the first oh. post, but it was like, it was daily update. You didn't have to wait until, you know, the next morning's paper. But in 2007, especially for a paper like the Buffalo News, which was very slow to change, um, back then, I think they, they changed maybe too quickly and too frequently now, but uh, back then they were too slow to change. Uh, that was a radical thing for the, for the Buffalo news to have a, have a blog. And I posted it on that blog and, and broke that story. And then uh, Drury's story was broken by ESPN, I believe. Um, no, it wasn't ESPN because ESPN didn't have the, 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 the contract back then and they didn't care. Um, so I'm guessing it was TSN probably broke that the jewelry deal and that was it. And then a couple of days later, we're talking about whether the bill or whether the Sabres, uh, uh should be held hostage on Thomas Vanek. What do you remember about that time, Jonah? I mean, we weren't, we knew each other back then, but we weren't tight. I don't, uh, I don't, what were you covering back then? Or was, was the NHL on your radar as much as it is now? I was not covering the Sabres of the NHL and on my radar at that time, I didn't think of the time. So at that time, I'm a reporter of the Niagara Gazette covering colleges, mostly a little bit of high schools, a little bit of other stuff. And I'm and Tim Schmidt, our editor, is covering the Sabres and I'm not covering the Sabres at all. But, you know, we're in the office putting the paper out, reading the wire. I remember it being a huge deal and not just what happened on June 1st, but all of the talk. Um, in the weeks, July 1st, all the talks in the weeks in the month of June leading up to it and what was rumored and what was expected to happen and probably things that you and Bucky Gleason and John Wyro and others wrote before that. And it seemed like in many ways, you know, it was a blunder of the Sabres not to bring back the two popular captains from this hugely popular team that, uh, you know, had made their runs into the Stanley Cup final and, and President's Trophy and all of that. But it wasn't a big surprise. It was kind of thought that it could happen. And, um, you know, I, I looking back now, I'm trying to think if I had this at the time, it seems like a team that thought they had gotten as far as they could and wanted these, didn't want to pay these older players and wanted to go young and tank or rebuild. But then they turn around and they don't take the draft picks for Thomas Vanek. Oh, they didn't want to tank. They, I thought they thought they could rely on their youth. They thought that guys like Derek Roy and Jason Pominville were ready to step up and take those leadership roles. They weren't tanking. I think they still thought of themselves as contenders or rebuilding, um, I guess I would say, but they were ready. It was a little bit of a reset. I think that, uh, and that included it was strange to say, but you know, Jay McKee and it included Brian Campbell. There were a lot of players that they could have had cheaper than what they signed for with other teams. But the Sabres had this really weird policy of not negotiating in season. Now, of course, they did with Drury uh, on the QT. Uh, but I recall, you know, Jay McKee could have been had for a fraction of what he signed with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, Brian Campbell could have been had for a fraction of what he signed with, uh, who was it, the Florida Panthers. 
Um, there, but they could have had Briere at a frack. They could have had Briere probably for that contract had they done it, had they not waited until f- he's he's now f- four days away from free agency. Why isn't he going to wait and see what everybody's got to offer at this point? It was just a maddening, uh, a maddening negotiating stance or, or strategy from the Sabers that Darcy Regeer believed in, and I think also uh, was reinforced by both Tom Golisano and Larry Quinn. Right. Those decisions were that day and the decisions that were made going into that day were the the avatar for any failings, perceived failings that Tom Golisano had as an owner, that Darcy Regeer had as a general manager, Larry Quinn and his role with the Sabres. And that lingered for as long as those three men were in charge of the franchise and through the sale of the team to the Pagulas and the changeover in ownership and leadership into the next era that made different mistakes and different decisions and to get the franchise to even lower places. But it does feel like a lot of things started that day, even though there really isn't a through line. I don't really think that those decisions that day are still affecting the franchise, but a lot of fans probably do feel that way. I, I, I need to correct myself. It was, uh, I, I forgot that the Sabres uh, traded Brian Campbell to San Jose uh, before he ended up in Florida, but it was a situation, it was a situation where they traded him rather than run out the clock, but it was a, they wouldn't negotiate. Uh, they could have had a deal, but they waited too long and they ended up losing him. They had to trade him. Uh, and uh, Jay McKee signed with St. Louis. I, I in, in both cases, I I screwed up and, and forgot the team in between. Uh, Jay McKee ended his career with Pittsburgh. But um, yeah, that was um, it was it was a weird time. I mean, <laughs> it was maddening if you were a fan just to see that these guys are leaving and I'm having conversations with them. Uh, I guess as a journalist, it was even more um, bemusing for me. I mean, I, again, and I, we, we have this discussion about the, the role of a journalist. I, I felt bad for Sabres fans. I didn't care one way or the other whether, I guess I should say I cared whether Breer and Drury left because I liked them both as human beings. And they were very good to me. They, they were incredibly respectful. I loved having them in the locker room. They were the type of people that when I went to work every day, I looked forward to seeing them and saying hello to them and and sometimes interviewing them, depending on what story I was working on. Um, So, yeah, Jay McKee is another one of those guys. And so was Brian Campbell, for that matter. I mean, so I guess I cared in that regard. But in terms of whether the Sabres have these guys, I didn't have that. I don't have that vested interest or that um, that emotional attachment to it, like like uh, because I'm not a fan. but in talking to them and their agents and talking to Darcy Regeer, and uh, I'm uh, for those who are just listening and not watching, uh, I'm pushing my fists together and just understanding that, hey, Darcy, if you would have just talked to these guys two months ago when they were telling me on the record for stories that I'm running that they want to negotiate and then Sabres are just saying, well, we don't negotiate in season. Um, we're going to have to wait until the season's over. And, and that's. The thing about, and especially hockey players, um, there's a loyalty, there's a code, you know, everything that you hear with hockey, there's some, you know, some things that are strange, you know, you're not allowed to step on the logo, even though it's right there on the floor. Um, the different codes that are involved, the loyalty, uh, the team, the camaraderie, the dressing room, uh, the sanctity of that, of that dressing room. Um, when those guys are in season, they will practically die for each other. And I learned this during the lockout. And then not in the season, they're looking, then it's their time to look out for themselves. Um, And it's kind of understood. But during season, everything's all about pulling together, doing the right thing. We have to win here. Um, You know, standing up for your teammate type thing. And that's the time when you should be negotiating. Especially If you're in the hockey business and you understand that, as Darcy Regeer is a lifer, um, if you want to get a guy to agree to a team deal, you do it during the season, not after the season, because that's his time to be like, all right, now I get, now here's where I take care of my stuff. Here's where I take care of my family and my, you know, my retirement and my future and all that other stuff. The season's over. We're not playing for a Stanley cup anymore or to fight, to get into the playoffs. We're not practicing every day. I'm not seeing these guys I and mean, we're not bleeding together and sweating together and traveling together to 41 road games and sleeping in the same hotels and doing all this. We're not doing that anymore. I'm now off at my cottage 
And I have the ability now to think for myself and by myself and be, this is my time to be a little selfish for these next couple of months. And then that's when the Sabres would choose to come negotiate. Well, how foolish is that? I mean, just on its face, right? I mean, if I was in hockey, if I were an executive, I would be negotiating in season all the time because that's when you're going to get your best deal. Um, and the Sabres just refused to do it. And, and, and in covering it and in talking to these guys, the players, and how frustrated they were, they wanted to stay. They wanted to remain Sabres. The Sabres just wouldn't talk to them. And uh, that's, that's the thing that is that when I, when I think back on that time of covering those really good Sabres teams and how mismanaged it was that they let these guys get away, so many of them, and it was, it was poor management. And I believe, you correct me if I'm wrong, you left the Sabres Beach shortly after that. I did. Well, I took a job with the Palm Beach Coast Post covering the NFL. Uh, and I left, uh, I covered the opening game. And I guess, uh, appropriately enough, I covered the 2008, 2000, or 2007, 2008 season opener. It was going to be my last game. Uh, John Vogel and I were going to go out and have beers after, and it was going to kind of be a symbolic last night on the job. Uh, and my computer, uh, broke down. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't file, so I didn't write. And, uh, so that was the first game of, of the Sabres in the post Drury Briere era. Um, and my computer broke. Deadline. Huh? You missed your last deadline. I, well, I didn't have a deadline. I called the office and said, I'm not writing tonight. And that was that. Uh, Jonah, anything else you want to add here? We, we talked for a while. We had a lot of bips, a lot of bops. You know, if, if I just want to revisit that big 10 conference conversation really quickly, because I think people will have this question on whether this reorganization of college sports, college football and the big 10, how that affects UB or really any of the local yeah. teams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you that, football. and then we got I, I broke away from the conversation. Yeah, well, how do you think this affects Western New York colleges, if at all? Well, we'll only talk about UB right now because they're the only one that plays football, and this, I think, is a very much a gotcha. football-driven situation at the moment. But it could, like, it could trickle down to all of the leagues if that Super League scenario that you point out happens and there's no more NCAA tournament, and I think that destroys the mid-major leagues if they don't have that opportunity to play in the NCAA tournament, play non-league games against major college teams. I don't know. Everybody becomes, I think, a lower level, a Division two or Division three that's not in these power conferences. But I don't know if that doomsday scenario happens all that soon. A lot of things will, a lot of dominoes will have to fall before we get to that point. Specific to UB playing a MAC football team. I mean, UB is always sort of fit institutionally into the Big Ten as the type of university that it is and you know buffalo is a small market in terms of professional sports and you know compared to bigger markets but it's a medium-sized market in terms of television and entertainment and it could be a market that a college conference might want to have a footprint into and geographically buffalo might have made sense for the big 10 at some point in time and now if you see a league that has 16 teams and rumored to be spreading to 24 teams at some point in time. Uh, you know, you could see a possibility where Buffalo is a team to consider there with the success that they've had in football and basketball in recent seasons, men's and women's basketball. I don't expect that to happen. I think that if the Big Ten expands to 24 teams, it's probably going to do so at the expense of more teams from the Pac-10, the Pac-12, more teams from the Big 12, um, maybe even the ACC, if this rumor that it's just going to be two huge superpower leagues and the SEC and the Big Ten, it could be maybe three superpowers or reoriented around a power four and one of these leagues gets left out. Um, but it, I don't know. I think it depends on also ESPN and Fox and the television stations that are really putting pumping the money into this operation and do they want it to be restricted to 60 to 65 teams, or maybe that expands and swells out to be a 72 or an 80 team type structure. And, and Buffalo might be a team that's on the cusp of being asked to join into that big league club. So it could go that way as well. I, I, I don't think, and I've done no like 
recent reporting on this, but from the reporting I've done in the past on whether UB could end up in the Big Ten, there's really no push or plan to do it right now, but it is kind of the dream and it is the conference where they would fit if there was some kind of expansion, but they fit somewhat because of the geographics that are completely changing now. Now it looks like the Big Ten wants to expand nationally and something that's further away might have more value than a university that's a little bit closer. Yeah, I, I think it'll be a while before we see some trickle down, right? But that's, that's, how, we'll, that's how it'll happen. But I don't think if, if it's going to be 24 teams in the Big Ten and 24 teams in the SEC, I don't know if that's enough schools for a big, you know, college football landscape as we know it. It might be what those schools it's, and those leagues want. But it's, is a that third of, it's a want? third of the football teams, right? How many, how many Division well, A teams are there? Yeah, it's, I think there's 131, if not maybe one or two more joining this year. Um, it's more than a third. It's more than a third, but it's only a third. And it's less than the 64, 65, and then you got Notre Dame and you have Cincinnati's, you know, was in the college football playoff last year. Where do all these schools shake out? You know, I, I, somebody maybe smarter and more plugged into the television industry would have to know what is the number? How many teams does ESPN want? You know, the Bulls. There's, there's more and more Bulls games every year. So there's got to be more than 48 teams to fill just the bowl games and you know, maybe, I don't know where this goes with the playoffs, but it just seems like more than two 2014 leagues will be necessary, even though the SEC and the Big Ten would probably like to monopolize it for themselves. Yeah. Well, we talked about a lot. I want to uh, correct myself yet again regarding Brian Campbell. Yes, he was traded to the San Jose Sharks for Steve Bernier and a draft pick that turned into Tyler Ennis, by the way. And then he signed with the Chicago Blackhawks where he won a Stanley cup. And uh, then after that signed with the Florida Panthers, he's now uh, rising up the ranks, by the way, uh, in the Chicago Blackhawks front office and uh, is one of the first, I don't know, I think four or five names on the masthead when it comes to uh, hockey operations uh, with the Chicago Blackhawks. Now, of course, they've undergone a lot of upheaval with their scandal, but Always like Brian Campbell. I think uh, I'm rooting for him. By the way, so you have Chris Drury with the Rangers, general manager. Daniel Briere, I think, is assistant GM is his title with the Flyers. Mike Greer might be the next general manager of the San Jose Sharks. Brian Campbell, as I just mentioned. Uh, Jay McKee just won the uh, – the, whatever uh, whatever championship uh, with the team he coaches in Hamilton. Um, these guys seem to be doing all right. I guess sounds they like, – Go like ahead. A group you might have wanted to keep together if you had them all playing <laughs> on the same team. Yeah, they seem to be decent leaders. Uh, and uh, and let's see, where Jay McKee, I'm, I'm having a little trouble uh, with my uh, – yeah, he's the with the Hamilton Bulldogs of the OHL, and they won the uh, they won the title just like two weeks ago. Well, congratulations, Jay McKee. Yeah, yeah, the J. Ross Robertson Cup. It's called these days. The OHL Championship. All right, that's enough. Uh, Jonah, thanks for this. Have a great 4th of July weekend. Uh, don't burn your hand on the sparklers. Don't blow off any fingers. Thanks to everybody out there for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you.
Oh, 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 oh,